If you happen to follow Hamilton, you will know that he has started a new series called CNC with me. This is where he creates a new project each week with only three different bits. I had the opportunity to help Hamilton out and provide him some files for his inaugural project drop. Coupled with that, I get a lot of questions about the actual process of producing G-code and then getting that G-code into the CNC for milling. I went back and reviewed a ton of prior videos and it seems I've never gone through the entire process end to end and covered every single step. So in this video, I'm going to walk you through the detailed process of taking a simple vector file, getting it into Fusion 360, creating the tool paths, exporting the G-code, and then getting that G-code into your machine and ultimately milling the project. Today's video will focus on Fusion 360, but I plan on doing the same exact process with Inventables Easel and Carbide Create. Now, I really only have the Onefinity, so I can't demonstrate the process with other CNC machines. But I will vary the process a little to show techniques that can be used for other machines. I will include chapter markers on the bottom of the video and in the description so you can jump to a specific section if you're comfortable with a specific step. Alright, let's get started by jumping into Infinity Designer to show you the file that we are going to use and how to get the vector into Fusion 360. If you don't have Infinity, which I highly recommend, you can also use Inkscape, a great free alternative. Alternatively, you can sacrifice your next born child or grandchild and pay for Adobe Illustrator. It's your choice. All right, so here we are in Affinity Designer. And so what you see in front of you is the graphic that we are going to import into Fusion 360. It is a very simple dog foot with a couple paws. This is one of the files that I provided to Hamilton. So if you happen to participate in his CNC with me and you become a member, you'll have access to this file. And so I am going to show you how to take this flat SVG and get it into Fusion 360 and do some milling with it. So in Affinity Designer as well as Inkscape and Adobe you can export this file as an SVG and so the way to do that here is you just select export in Affinity, you select SVG as your format and then you just go ahead and click export. One thing to note here is you do want to export this file as 96 dots per inch because that is what Fusion expects when you import it. If you leave it at the more traditional 72 dots per inch, then it'll be a little bit smaller inside of Fusion. Sometimes that matters, sometimes it doesn't. In this case, it doesn't matter so much, so uh, we can scale this once we get into Fusion. But if you have two parts that you want to fit together precisely, then outputting in the proper dimensions absolutely is required. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to cancel here because I already have the SVG, and you will too if you get Hamilton's files. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and we're going to pivot over to Fusion 360, and we're going to get on with it. Okay. Here we are in Fusion 360, a super quick walkthrough of the user interface. You have your toolbar on top. You have your browser on the left-hand side of the screen here. You have the cube here that allows you to rotate around a little bit if you want to do that. And then a little quick toolbar on the bottom. Uh, you don't really need the things here on the bottom very often, but it, if you want to adjust things like the grid and snap to grid and other things, you can do that down here. Okay, so... I'm going to try and walk you through this fairly quickly, but also cover the things that are most important. So the first thing we want to do is we want to go ahead and we want to create a sketch with the size of the uh, stock or the wood that we are going to use. So in my case, I have stock that is 8 inches by 8 inches. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click create sketch right here in the toolbar and I am going to select this bottom plane here. You can select this plane or that plane, it doesn't really matter, but it's just better if you select that XY plane for when we get into the cam operations. So I'm going to select that here, scroll out a little bit, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click this uh, two-point rectangle icon here. I am going to click the origin and expand it out from the left to the right. Next, I want to go ahead and dimension this so that we get that eight by eight inch rectangle. And so there's two ways to do this. I'm gonna hit escape to get out of the rectangle. 
I'm going to say create, or you can say uh, sketch dimension. Alternatively, you can hit D on the keyboard. So let's go ahead and hit a dimension. I'm going to select this line, pull it out. You can see right now it's 4.823 inches. What we want is an 8 inch square. So I'm going to click once with the left mouse button, type in 8, and we're going to get 8 inches just like that. And then I want to do the same for this top line here. And so I want to say 8 inches. There you go. So now you have a rectangle that is 8 by 8. I am going to click Finish Sketch. Now to import that SVG, you have a couple different options. You can import it directly onto the sketch that you just created, or you can import it onto a new sketch. I like importing it onto a new sketch because then that way if you need to turn it on or turn it off or scale it in a way that doesn't involve that base sketch that we have here, you can do so much easier. So what we're going to go ahead and do is I'm going to create a new sketch. And rather than selecting this plane, I am going to select the previous sketch. That makes our new sketch the same size as the previous sketch. So we're going to go ahead and click on that. There you go. Now I have import SVG right here in the toolbar. If you don't have that, you could just select insert. There's a couple different options here. You can say insert that SVG. You can do a DXF, which is a more legacy format that is similar to SVG. And you can even insert uh, McMaster car components to give you some 3D bodies. In this case, again, we're gonna do insert SVG. We're gonna go ahead and get, see this pop up. Normally, if you have SVG stored in Fusion, you can access them right here. I don't have this SVG in Fusion. Instead, I want to insert from my computer. Uh, it opened the folder that I was in last, but here we go. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to select that dog foot SVG and click open. Now, what you can see here is it pulls that SVG up into Fusion. And it's a little bit low. It's not where we want it right now. Uh, so it gives us these little handles to move up and down, left and right. And then we can also scale it using this slider here. Alternatively, we also have this dialog box here that allows us to precisely position things left, right, uh, in the Z direction if you want to tilt it or skew it for some reason as well as scaling it. You can also flip it horizontal or vertical if you need to do that. Sometimes Fusion imports the SVGs. They're either backwards or they're upside down, so you can use these buttons very easily to do that, sort of flipping rather than rotating. In this case, I, uh, it looks pretty good. I just want to move it straight up here. And you can see if I zoom in, it's just a little bit smaller than the stock. So I want to increase its size just a bit. And so I'm going to pull this handle and I'm going to pull down just two clicks here. And you can see over here, uh, we've now scaled it uh, by uh, 1.101. So anything above one makes something bigger. Anything smaller than one makes it smaller. Uh, so that looks probably like it's just a little bit too big. So we're going to do one click just right there. And then this little square box here, rather than moving it up and down and left and right, it allows you to move it in arbitrary directions. And so we're going to grab that and kind of just trying to center this. It doesn't have to be perfect. I'm just going to visually sort of eyeball it. That looks good right there. Okay, so as you can see here, it's roughly about a quarter of an inch or so uh, up into the left. So I'm going to click OK. And now we have that secondary sketch. If I click Finish Sketch, and I open in the browser the sketch area, you can see the two sketches. I can turn off the foot and then turn off the base or turn on the foot and turn on the base. So this is super helpful. If you happen to have multiple pictures or multiple drawings that you want to have inside of a single design, you can put them on separate sketches and then you can turn them off or turn them on on demand. The next thing we need to do is we need to take our sketch and we need to extrude it into a 3D body. So to do that, it's easiest to turn off that base sketch right here, leaving just our dog footprint, and then say create, extrude. That allows us to take that sketch and turn it into a 3D body. Alternatively, you can just press E on the keyboard. All right, so we're gonna say extrude. I am now, it's over here, you got this little pop-up button. You get to select your profile and a couple different options that are not important for us right now, but just know that they're there. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna select our uh, dog footprint. And I am also gonna select all of the dog's pads so that we get one complete model that is full without any pockets yet. Okay, and so now the options are to extrude it up or to extrude it down. I am going to extrude it down negative 20 millimeters, and I will explain why in just a minute. So I'm going to click return. 
uh, which closes that sketch and extrude box. And what you see is we have our 3D model now. It is, uh, in this case, it has the appearance of wood. That's just my choice, but you can choose some other appearance if you want as a default. But you can see here that if I rotate, the model is actually below the plane here instead of above the plane. That was the negative 20 millimeters. So why did I do negative 20 instead of positive 20? Well, it's a personal preference of mine, but if we turn the sketch back on, you will see now that that sketch is on the top of the 3D model instead of the bottom. If we had extruded it up, that sketch would be on the bottom. And so when we go now, we wanna create those wells or the pads as uh, pockets. Now we can extrude straight down into the model instead of having to adjust our um, profile plane that we are extruding from. So what do I mean by that? I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna click Create again. We're gonna do Extrude. I'm gonna select the pads, one, two, three, four, and five. And so now I want to extrude down into the model. And so if I want to say a negative 12 millimeters, for example, uh, it's about a half an inch to cut down into our material, which is slightly thicker than three quarters of an inch. All right, so now what you can see is Fusion has automatically detected that we are extruding down into an existing 3D body. So rather than creating additional material, it is removing material. That is called a cut. And over here in our window, what you can see is the distance that we're doing is negative 12, and it is a cut rather than a join or an intersect or even creating a new body or a new component. And so that is important if you want to create a specific type of thing with your extrude operation. In this case, a cut is what we're looking for, so we're good to go. I'm gonna click OK. So now what we have is we'll expand over here in the browser. We have a single body that represents our dog footprint bowl. This is exactly what we want our bowl to look like when we are done with the milling. Okay, so this is really cool. We're gonna go ahead and turn off that sketch and this is the 3D model. This is exactly what we want it to look like in the end. So now to take this model and turn it into something that the CNC can use, we are gonna pivot into the manufacturing workspace. And we do that by clicking the design button up here and we scroll down to manufacturer. The manufacturing workspace is where we do all of our computer aided manufacturing work, otherwise known as CAM. Okay, now that we are in this workspace, the first thing that we need to do is we need to create a setup. Now you can have multiple setups if you have multiple parts. What the setup does is it allows us to set the origin for where the machine will start cutting. So like I said, if you have multiple parts, you might want that origin to be in a different place depending on the part. In this case, we have a single part, so we will have a single setup. I am gonna right click that setup menu, click new setup. The little pop-up shows up here, and what you will see right off the bat, there are three tabs, one for setup, one for stock, and one for post-processing. The first thing you want to focus in on on that setup screen here is selecting your machine. Uh, I found it really important in the latest version of Fusion to have a machine selected because it sets additional parameters that you can use in your post-processing. In this case, the most recent thing I have used is this Onefinity. This is actually a community version of the machine library and the post-processor that I use. It's out on GitHub. I will link to it below if you want to use it as well. There are other machines in the Fusion library, quite a lot. The vast preponderance of them are actually 3D printers. If you want to use this for 3D printing, you can do that as well. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select the Onefinity machine. And you'll see the screen changed a little bit and now knows a little bit about uh, the machine, so it adds some additional parameters here. So the next thing we want to do is we want to click on the model and I want Fusion to know what model we are going to be milling with. So we click that and it automatically selected the model for us. Okay, so we're super cool. The next thing to note on this tab of the setup screen is where the origin is. Now it is your preference and your choice where you want the origin to be. The way you select that here is you can select it here under origin. Uh, you can use the model origin any point a point on the model and a point on the stock. So in this case, it's already set to the center of the model and the center of the stock. 
generally speaking, that has become my preference because it's easier to find the zero point in the center of the material than it is on a corner. But if you're removing a lot of material and you need to re-home or re-zero for some reason, uh, then maybe having on the corner might be a better deal. So if we wanted to change it to the corner, for example, let's go ahead and click stock point. And then you will see, if I click here where it says select, it's gonna show the stock and all these different points right here, these little white dots, on what stock point do I want to be the origin for all of the milling operations. Now, because the rest of the programs that I am gonna review in this series generally require the origin to be in the lower left-hand corner, that is what I'm going to do here. So I'm gonna select this point right here, and you can see that it moved that little coordinate axis indicator to that corner. And what you see is the x-axis is going this way, the y-axis is going that way, and z-axis is going that way. That is exactly the orientation that we will ultimately end up having on the machine. So that is the orientation we want here. Okay, moving on. We click the next tab. This is the stock tab. Now Fusion's already tried to make a guess on what, how, what size we want the stock to be. And so it has guessed that we want a relative size stock relative to the model. Other, other options are fixed size cylinders, tubes, and a variety of other things here. In this case, we know that the wood that we have or the stock is eight by eight. It is a fixed size. It is not sized relative to the model. So I'm gonna select fixed size box, and I wanna tell it that we have stock that is eight by eight, and it is 20 millimeters tall. Right, and so that sets the stock at the size that we actually have on the machine. And you can see if we scroll here just a little bit or zoom out, um, the model is slightly smaller than the stock. This is exactly what we're looking for. So this is perfect. We've set our stock now onto the next tab. Next tab is the thing called part positioning. You can move the part around if you want and avoid fixturing um, and change a couple other options. We won't have any of that here. And I generally ignore that tab pretty much every single time that I use the cam operation. So we'll just go ahead and skip right over it here. Next is the post-processing tab. This is very important. Uh, this is where we can set uh, parameters for the post-processing that takes this model and turns it into G-code. So the first thing here is a program number. Uh, this is arbitrary. You can type whatever you want in here. I usually type in the name. So in this case, I'm gonna say this is a dog foot. Dog foot. There you go, and the program comment, I usually put the name and the comment the same. Again, these are arbitrary, but they will come up later on and I will show that to you. The other thing here, because we have selected our machine, uh, Fusion is now aware of the work coordinate system that we're using, and so we're gonna leave it as the default uh, work coordinate system, which is a G54. Um, but if you do have multiple work coordinate systems set up, like for example, if you're using the Maso controller, instead of the build botics, you can check it here and you can do an offset. We're not gonna do that here right now. We're just gonna go ahead and click okay. All right, so now that uh, Fusion has done the setup, you can see we have a new folder under setups. Now we can change the name if we want to. Not a big deal if you don't want to. But if you click it open, you can now see that it shows the machine associated with that setup. And that's important, again, because it has specific machine parameters in there. And you can edit the machine too, by the way, if you wanna do so by going under the tool library for your end mills or under the machine library here. If you wanna change some of those parameters, I'm not gonna dive into that right now. Okay, so the first thing we wanna do is now we wanna start creating some tool paths. We create the tool pass. I am gonna start by creating the pockets or the holes here. Um, and then we're gonna move on to the profile or the contour cut. So first thing we wanna do, go under 2D. We're gonna do 2D milling here, not 3D milling. 2D, we wanna do a 2D pocket. I'm gonna click that right there. And it opens up this dialog. There are a number of tabs and there are a vast number of variables that you can set I am gonna walk through the ones that are most important and the ones that will get you up and running the fastest. So the first thing we wanna do on the very first tab is we wanna select the tool that we want to use. Now I'm gonna click on that. It's gonna open up the select tool dialog. Immediately there's nothing selected because there are no tools associated with this design. But what you can see is there's a number of uh, tool libraries already established here with Fusion. I have a local one and then I have three of them stored in the cloud. I have the Amana library, my own personal library, and then a Whiteside library. So what I've done is I've loaded the Amana 
and the white side, and then I've copied some of the tools into my library, the specific tools that I actually own and I have. So I do everything out of my library, I make all my changes out of my library, and I tweak these settings to work for my machine and my workflow. Okay, so I've selected my library. You can see all the tools I have here, not too many, but it's a fair number. Uh, the key thing here is you can filter down to quickly find the tools you want here on the right-hand side of the screen. So to create those pockets, what we want is we want a bowl cutting bit. So in Fusion 360, a bowl cutting bit is known as a bowl nose end mill. That is in contrast to a ball nose end mill, which is completely rounded instead of a bull nose end mill, which is only rounded on the corners. And then the other one you're most likely to run into is a flat end mill, and then an engraving or a chamfer end mill. For this specific design, we're only going to use two bits, a flat end mill and a bull nose. So I'm going to select bull nose, and you can see here are all of the bits that I have. I'm going to look for the one that I want. In this case, I want the three quarter inch dish carving bit, which you can see is right here. So if I select it, it's going to show you a picture of the end mill so you can get some sense of what you're operating with. And it's going to show you the default parameters that are set up. And so I will get to those in just a minute. But for right now, we're going to go ahead and we're going to select it. And then you're going to go back to this pop-up window. And what you can see is all of those parameters, the spindle speed, the surface speed, the feed per tooth, all of that is now changed and associated with that end mill that we've chosen. So in this case, we have uh, 16,000 RPMs for the spindle speed and the ramping speed. We have a cutting feed rate of 120 inches per minute. Lead in, lead out, transition, ramp, plunge are all 120 minutes. Now, I don't like, uh, I would not want to plunge in this case at the same speed that we are cutting, so I'm going to change that to 60. Um, but I'm going to keep everything as the stock. Now, I will say 120 inches per minute is a little aggressive for a bit as large as three quarters of an inch, uh, but we're going to go ahead and we're going to try it and we're going to roll it and see what happens. Now, I did just notice for some reason Fusion changed my ramp rate to 60 when I changed my plunge rate. I think that's pre-programmed in, but I do want my ramp rate to be the same as my cutting rate. Um, that's my preference. Again, I like ramping at the same as the cutting speed, and I'll get to why here in just a minute. So quickly moving on to the next tab, we have our geometry tab. That is where we select what we actually want to mill, right? So in this case, we're doing a pocket, so we want these areas here, right? Uh, there's two ways to select a pocket in Fusion 360. You can select the outline of the pocket, like this little line here, or you can select the actual uh, flat pocket itself. I'm going to select the pocket right here, just like that. There you go. And it's now selected those pockets and self-constrained them based off the geometry that we have selected. And you can see there's one, two, three, four pockets selected. Okay, cool. Next tab, heights. So what we have is we have the clearance height, retract height, feed height, top height, and bottom height. This all seems very complicated. It's not. The clearance height is the height that the bit will go to when it's moving around rapidly. The retract height is where it retracts to above the workpiece, but it's not moving very far. The feed height is the height that it goes to when it's doing a rapid feed. And then the top height is the top of your stock. The bottom height is where the machine will ultimately cut to uh, when you specify that in your milling operation here. So in this case, I have my default set to 0.1 inches for everything except for the top height. The top height is set to stock top with no additional offset. So I want to start cutting at the top of the stock. The bottom height is set to the selected contours, which in this case are our pockets, with no additional offset. If you wanted to mill a little bit lower or a little bit less low, you can set offsets, offsets here. If you wanted to, for some reason to start above the stock, you can set that here. I would not recommend starting below the stock. Okay. Next tab is called Passes. This is very important for Fusion 360. By default, Fusion 360 assumes you are going to remove all the material in a single pass. That is, cut everything to the final depth in one pass. That is very suboptimal. <laughs> um, you want to take small bites away from your material. You want to work your way down to that final depth. That is, of course, if your depth is fairly deep, which in this case it is. It's a half an inch. Our bit isn't even a half an inch tall, so you certainly don't want to cut all the way down. So what we need to do is 
Uh, generally under the passes, I leave all these the same, but I select multiple depths. This is how we tell Fusion to work its way down to that final uh, depth that we have selected. So I'm going to check it here. Now, in my tool library, I have told Fusion 360 that for this bit, I like to work my way down to the final depth at 0.1 inches per pass. That is my choice. Generally, that range for me is somewhere between 0.125, an eighth of an inch, and 0.25, which is a quarter of an inch. Um, in this case, I know with this bit, 0.125 uh, produces pretty good results, a nice surface finish, so you don't have to do a final finishing pass, and it doesn't require a lot of sanding. Uh, and it's not so aggressive that you're going to end up with a lot of chatter or even maybe some tear out in the end. So uh, that's really important to set. Again, I would recommend if you want to go conservative, you set it an eighth of an inch. If you want to go a little bit more aggressive, I would not go more than a quarter of an inch. Uh, it really depends on what type of material you're cutting in though. Uh, so in this case, we don't want to have any finishing passes. As I've mentioned, we're going to get a good surface finish and I'm going to turn off stock to leave. If you wanted to, for some reason, leave a little extra material on these sides and the bottom, you can select stock to leave here and then you can come in later with a secondary or a final finishing pass. Uh, we're not going to do that here because it's just not necessary. So I'm going to unselect that. The last tab in the pocket area is the linking tab. There's some really critically useful information here. Um, if you are not, however, using ramping, uh, you're just doing a straight plunge cut, there's not a whole lot here you need to worry about. I am, however, going to use a ramp because I prefer to ramp into my material. And when we do the simulation, I will show you why. But for now, just know that I am going to set this at a 12 degree ramp. 8 is fine, even 20 is fine. I would not go lower than 5 degrees because that's a very narrow ramp and it really um, it kind of uh, makes the machine a little bit um, erratic, if you will. Uh, it just doesn't need to be that close together. Uh, one thing to note under the linking tab, you can set the safe distance. The safe distance um, is a specific distance set that you can avoid clamps and whatnot, uh, which is different than your retract height in the, uh, in the previous tabs. So in this case, we're going to leave everything the way it is, and I'm going to select OK. So now, what you see from Fusion 360, it has essentially done nothing. I have turned off automatic toolpath generation because I want to be able to control when the toolpaths are generated uh, in case I have something that's very complicated and I don't want to bog down the program uh, by generating toolpaths all the time every time I make uh, a simple change. Uh, so in this case, you see this, it says toolpath is out of date. It's the little orange icon with a little swirl on it. So you can right click and you select generate or alt alternatively, you can hit command or control G. In this case, I'm going to select generate. Uh, you can see suddenly it generated the toolpath. You get a little green check mark saying you're good to go, no errors. And you can see the toolpath is generated. So what we have here is blue is where you're doing cutting, red is where you're doing ramping, and yellow is where you are doing uh, a rapid up or a rapid movement left or right. And what a rapid is is where the machine moves very quickly, much faster than the cutting rate, to get to a position so that it can start cutting again. That's just a feature that allows you to save time um, by using that rapids function. Not all programs have a rapids function, and a lot of times uh, with some of the free software, for example, it'll only move to the next position at the cutting speed. So if you're cutting at, say, 40 inches per minute, then it's going to move to the next position at 40 inches per minute. Whereas with Fusion, you can cut at 40 inches per minute and then move to the next position, say, at 200 or 250 inches per minute. Just saves a little bit of milling time. Okay, so zooming in, what you have is a toolpath here where it's going to move into the material here. The red is the starting point and the green is the finishing point, but it's going to move into the material and you can see the little swirl here. That is the rapid um, helix that we set in that ramping section, right? And then once it ramps in, it's just going to remove the material by going back and forth. So I am going to go ahead and click simulate to show you what that looks like. All right, so we have simulate on, the model is turned on. You can see our bit is right here. Um, you can adjust the speed here with this slider. I like to slow it down just a little bit. Um, you can click play to start it. You can move to the next move, which is the next line in the G-code. Uh, you can move to the next operation. If you have more than one operation, you can string them together here. Or if you just want to uh, get to the end, as it were, you can click this little arrow button here and it'll jump to the, the very last line and show you what it's going to look like after it's all said and done. So let's go ahead and click play here. You can see we slowed it down. 
the bit is engaging in the material. See how it's spinning and it's turning and it's not getting full depth yet? That is the ramping function. It is easing the bit into the material and I find this very valuable. It decreases the amount of stress on the bit and it really makes me a lot more comfortable rather than plunging directly into the material like a lot of programs do and really putting a lot of stress on that bit. Okay, so let's zoom out here a little bit. I'm gonna click stop. We're gonna jump to the end. And there's what you have. That is the, the pockets that we've created with that pocketing material. You can see it's cut about a half of the way through the material or just a little bit more than half. And it looks perfect. This is exactly what we're looking for from that operation. So I'm gonna exit the simulation and we're gonna move on to the next op. The next op is we wanna uh, cut out that outline. That is known as a contour or sometimes a profile path. So we're gonna say 2D. 2D contour. All right, and so you'll notice that Fusion has automatically selected the last bit that we had used. Now, in this case, we absolutely do not want to do a contour path with that bowl cutting bit. That wouldn't be very bright. So what we want to do is start by selecting the new bit. We want a flat end mill, as I mentioned earlier. I'm going to select flat end mill, select my library. These are all the flat end mills that I have. So in this case, I want a quarter inch end mill. So I'm going to select diameter under the filter. So I'm going to type in 0.25, press OK. And these are the five bits that I have that are quarter of an inch thick. So in this case, because we are cutting pretty deep into the material, I don't necessarily want to use a down cut bit that's going to pack all those chips into that, into that cut. I want an up cut bit. It looks like I have a couple to choose from. I happen to know that this uh, Amana bit here, the 46321K, uh, is one of my go-to bits. So I'm going to go ahead and select that one and click Select right here. And again, once again, it filled in all of the material. Now, because we are cutting deep into the material, I don't want to cut super, super fast. So the typical cutting rate that I recommend at 120 inches per minute is probably a little too aggressive when we get down deep into the materials. The deeper you get, the more the bit is contacting the side walls and the more likely you might get a little bit of tear out um, if you're moving too quickly. So what I like to do is just slow this down a little bit. It's called derating. And so when you're cutting deeper and deeper and deeper into material, the manufacturers generally recommend you slow down the feed rate. So in this case, I'm going to set it to 80. I have found that to work very well. Uh, so once again, we want to change the ramp to 80 as well. And then the plunge rate, in this case, we want to set to 40. I generally set my plunge to 50% of my feed rate. Uh, but because we are using ramping in this case, we're not going to need the plunge feed rate, but it's always good to set it anyway. Okay, just like the pocket, we're going to move on to the geometry. We're going to select this outside profile here. Now, when you select the outside, you can see it selects the profile all the way around, and you get this little red arrow here. This red arrow tells you on which side of that profile you want to cut. So in this case, the arrow is on this side, so you want to cut on the outside. If I were to click the arrow, it would move the arrow to the inside, and then it would now create a toolpath to cut on the inside. Most certainly, we do not want to cut on the inside, so I'm going to go back here, click on that arrow, and bring it back on the outside. Okay, so now here is where we have a couple different options for work holding. If we want to have tabs, this is where we would set tabs. Tabs allow you to add extra material, as you can see right here, so that when the profile is completely done, uh, these tabs are still allow the material to be held into place so it doesn't break free and potentially contact the bit, rattle around, destroy the material, destroy the bit, destroy the machine. I've had that happen. It is very unfortunate when it happens. Now, in our case, I'm going to use the blue tape method to hold everything down so I don't need tabs. Uh, but if you do, know that it's here. And you can do tabs by distance, which is the distance between the tabs, or you can do tabs by the number of tabs. It's your choice. I do recommend that your tab width be at least a quarter of an inch, and in many cases, at least one eighth of an inch tall. Um, you will see that. In some cases, if you set it for a 16th there, it might potentially break free. But you want a little extra material here, depending on what you're cutting, especially if the material is super brittle. You want those tabs to be just a little bit bigger to withstand those forces while cutting. So I'm going to deselect tabs because we're not going to use them. We're going to move on to heights. Just like the pocket, you can see we have a clearance, retract, feed, top height, and bottom height. Um, once again, all set the same for me. I like everything at a tenth of an inch. 
Uh, the top is set to the stock top and the bottom is set to the selected contour. Now this is one area. If your machine isn't trimmed or your wood isn't uh, particularly flat, you can set an offset here. I usually do 0 0.05, negative 0 0.05. And so what that means is cut 0.05 inches below the bottom. And so that guarantees that you, you cut all the way through that bottom of that wood. In this case, I'm gonna leave it at zero and hope that my measurement of 20 millimeters is spot on. We will see when we actually do the milling. Next is passes, just like the pocketing. And so once again, what you will notice here is multiple depths is not checked. You need to check that so Fusion doesn't take all of that cut in one go. So select multiple depths here. Now apparently I do not have this set in my tool library, so I need to set this. Again, I'm gonna set it at 0.15. I have found 0.15 to kind of be my sweet spot to allow me to mill pretty quickly, but still take off a fair amount of material. If I were to slow that feed rate down to maybe 60 inches per minute, I would feel comfortable taking a full quarter of an inch here. Uh, but given how deep we're cutting, I like to keep the uh, cuts a little more shallow and move a little bit more quickly. Uh, I just found that it produces better results overall and it's more reliable and it just makes me more comfortable. <laughs> so a couple things, uh, finish only at final depth. What that means, it will only engage this finishing feed rate when it gets to the bottom. That's important when you have a finish offset or you want to take a little bit of a material off. So in this case, the default is 8 thou. So what that means, the very last pass in this case, because we said finish only at final, it's going to move in and it's going to take 8 thou off the sides full depth. Um, I have found that to be completely okay. If you were to take off more material, um, certainly something like a tenth of an inch would be a lot of material to take off at a full inch depth. Uh, there would be a lot of tool reflection. It would be really, really unfortunate if that bit were to have a lot of deflection, catch the outside, and then potentially cause the machine to come apart or the bit to break or something like that. So this I have found fine. Everything works fine here. Um, here's a couple other options. Don't need to dwell on it. I will just note that uh, stock to leave is not checked here, so that's good. We definitely don't want to leave any stock, um, but it doesn't matter too much um, in the profile cut because you're going to be sanding it anyway, generally. Last tab again is linking. In this case, ramping is not set by default, so I want to select ramp. I want to set this to my 12 degree ramp, uh, and then also the clearance height, once again, is set at 0.02 inches. Um, that just means that it starts ramping very close to the material. Everything else is the same. I don't really change too much here, so I select OK. Once again, we got the arrow, so I'm going to hit Command G. It's going to compute my toolpath. There we go. There is the toolpath. You can see blue is the cutting, red is ramping. We can see that we start all the way over here and we end all the way over here. And our origin is here. Uh, so once again, we can simulate right here. So we'll hit play. It's slowly moving down in the material. You can see that it is moving along the profile, but it has not yet contacted the material. That is the ramping function. So if I speed it up a little bit here, you can see it slowly, it will start engaging the material right there. And it's removing just a little bit, not a whole lot. It is not cutting at full depth. It is working its way into the material and that dramatically reduces the stress. Now, because it's not doing that full depth cut and it's kind of working its way into the material, uh, the ramping does increase the milling time. And so you will find if you have ramping turned off, you'll probably save a minute or two for every one of these profiles. So if that is important to you, you're batching these out, for example, maybe a plunge cut is the way to go for you. Um, it's completely okay and it'll work just as well. I just think ramping is a little bit more safe and a little bit more conservative. Okay, so we're in stop. We're gonna hit play to the end and you can see it's cutting all the way through. If we had tabs, you'd see them here, but we don't. So it cuts all the way through. That's exactly what we're looking for. Okay, so exit the simulation. Okay, so now we have two separate tool paths. I am going to name them using my naming convention. Number one here, we're gonna click that and we're gonna say this is a pocket. And it is uh, 0.75 inches is the bit. Oops, 0.75, there you go. This one is a contour, a contour and it is 0 0.25 inches. This is my naming convention. It tells me the operation that I'm doing, a pocket, and the width of the bit that I'm using, 0.75. So then when I export this, I can see that in the program. I can see visually on the machine that which bit I need to use. So how do we turn these tool paths into G-code? That's why we're here. This is easy. All right, so we hit pocket. We right-click, and we say post-process. 
when selecting post processing. This is important why we selected that machine. Now it knows everything about the machine so it can post process it and tailor the G code to the machine that we have. And you can see here the machine is set to the Onefinity. It is uh, using the Onefinity post processor. All right, so we set dog foot earlier in the setup. You see it again here, dog foot, it's already there. All right, so dog foot 0.75. That is the size of the bit. This is, again, my naming convention. You can name it whatever you want. You can see here that the output folder is already set to dogfoot. That is something that I had selected earlier. Um, it usually defaults to wherever your, uh, your NC folder is or whatever the last folder that you were in was. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select post. Okay, down here in the lower corner, it says you successfully post-processed it. Uh, there was a link if you wanted to look at the file and view the G code, you could totally do that. So we're going to do the same here. We're going to post-process this guy right here. We're going to say dogfoot 0.25. We're going to copy that, paste it in there, and we're going to post-process it. All right, here you go. Successfully posted. Click here if you want to see that. All right, cool beans. Now, I'm going to show you a little trick here. Over here, there's a folder. It's called NC Programs. You have those two exporting capabilities set for you already. And so I'm going to name this guy the same that I named the uh, file, and I'm going to name this guy this guy, 75, just like that. And now we know. So if we make a change to any of these uh, tool paths, it's going to uh, require us to potentially regenerate the tool path and redo that export function of the G code. This is important because a lot of times if you make changes to your tool path, you might forget to export the G code again. Fusion will tell you, and I will show you, for example, let's go ahead and change the pocket. Um, we're going to change the spindle speed, for example, uh, 18,000 RPMs. There you go. So now what you see is the tool path doesn't need to be recomputed because we just changed the speed, but it knows here, that it says that the G code that we exported is now out of date. How cool is that, right? So now we just say we want to regenerate that. Say, go here, post-process. Do you want to overwrite the file that you just saved? Yes or no? So in this case, we're going to say no, because I like the uh, spindle speed that we are at. Okay, so now we have our two G code files. How do we get them to the machine? That is very easy with the Onefinity. You can put those two G code files on a USB flash drive, plug it in your machine, and it'll show up in the drop down. Alternatively, if your machine is on the network, you can just pull up the user interface on in the browser and upload it straight from your computer. My preference is my machine is on the network. I use that network upload capability so I don't have to futz around with a USB drive. Um, but it's up to you. Many other machines, the Shape Oko, the X-Carve, the Nomad, even the uh, Jimitsu here behind me that I reviewed a few weeks or so ago, uh, you have to put that uh, G-code on some sort of flash drive and then manually put it in the machine and then select that from the machine. It's no big deal, but that is the process. Once you have those files, copy it onto the flash drive, stick the flash drive in your machine, use the interface on your machine to get access to that file, and you select it. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead as I am going to pull up the machine. I am going to start it. I am going to upload it, and then we're going to go off to the races. We are going to carve this guy, and then we're going to come back and show you the results. All right, well, it is a new day, and we have a new set of infinite possibilities. Let's go ahead and pivot over to the machine, and let me show you what I'm going to do. All right, so here we are in the Onefinity user interface. I have not done anything to the machine other than turn it on. I haven't even homed it yet, so that is something that we do need to do. So a real quick walkthrough of the user interface. We have the control pad here that allow us to jog the machine. We have the current set of positions and whether or not the machine has been homed and zeroed, uh, and a little bit of status information right here in the middle. Down here, we have the section where we can upload files, and so that's what we are going to do. I'm going to go ahead and select this little folder here, which is going to take me to the last location that I was at. I am going to select the 0.75 or the 3 quarter of an inch bowl bit here. Click OK. Now it's going to process for a little brief period of time, and then what we're going to see, hopefully, there you go, is a render in the right-hand side of the screen here that shows what we're about to cut. It looks pretty good. Uh, one thing to note here is this is very useful. Let me go ahead and blow this up a little bit. Scroll down. You can see that it shows where the origin is right here, so it is in a lower left-hand corner. Remember, we set that during our cam operations. There are lots of different places you can set your origin. Usually I do it in the center or in the lower left corner. So that's how my mental cue right here. 
Okay, so we got this uploaded. What I'm gonna do is affix the material to the work surface. I am going to home the machine and then I'm going to the zero machine to that lower left corner. And then I'm gonna click play and we're gonna watch it cut away. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, switch views into the other camera and we'll get on with it. With our milling complete, I did a little cleanup on the bowl by rounding over the edges with a 1 8 inch round over bit, a little light sanding, and a dunk in some mineral oil. And here is the finished product. Pretty cool for only 10 minutes of milling and a little bit of cleanup time. End to end, the process took us about 30 minutes, including the CAD and the cam work. Batching out a bunch of these would be super easy to do, and you can sell them for around $30 or $40 each. If you are interested in creating one of these, I will link to the Fusion 360 file that we created in this video down below. Alternatively, you can join Hamilton in his CNC with me series, and you can get access to this file and many, many, many other files. If you are interested in how to use Fusion 360 to quickly batch out projects like this, then I encourage you to check out this video right here. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for getting this far. And don't forget to be inspired.